welcome uh, Sister Yvonne Ridley. Uh, I'm really privileged uh, to have conversation with you. Uh, mashallah, we all know that you have been a human rights activist and a vocal journalist for a very long time. Uh, as you know, 2021 has been a very tumultuous year in many ways, from Palestine to the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan to the continuing pandemic. What does a road ahead look like? for many of these shared struggles and oppressions with the ascent of a right-wing fascism in many parts of the world? Well, you know, I remember having a conversation with a famous war correspondent called Mary Colvin. She was a friend of mine and we were talking Gosh, this must have been more than 20 years ago now. And we were talking about her work and she said, you know, Yvonne, I'm not going to go out of business anytime soon as a war correspondent. And of course, now we are um, in a, the new millennium, 20 years on, and the picture is just as bleak. I'm not going to go out of business anytime soon um, writing about wars or visiting conflict zones because unfortunately um, there are uh, men in our world today who are ruling um, or in control who are addicted to war. And you look at uh, the situation of Iraq and it has descended into even more turmoil. Um, it is by no means better off now than it was before the invasion of Iraq in 2003. You look across North Africa, which was, you know, the flame of independence and rebellion uh, was burning brightly. You look at uh, Egypt, it's back in, in the control of uh, what I would say is a brutal dictatorship. Um, Libya is a basket case and uh, Tunisia is struggling because there are countries afraid of democracy that are working round the clock to undermine the fledgling democracy that the Tunisian people have. You go over to Afghanistan, 20 years of um, rule by corrupt governments have uh, left their mark on the people. And so when the Taliban uh, rose up, uh, they were welcomed back. And now we're told that um, millions are on the brink of starvation in Afghanistan. Yemen is another area where children are dying daily through malnutrition. And when you think, you know, this is the 21st century and our children are still dying through starvation and malnutrition, you know, that is unacceptable, especially when you look at the obscene amounts of wealth and power that are being held by some. And, and yet, you know, children are still starving today. So, gosh, that sounds really depressing, doesn't it? And then you've got Okay, so you have given actually a bird's eye view of what is happening going on around the world. So what role does the media play in telling such stories? We know uh, the disastrous role they have played in making imperialist invasions possible. Uh, but isn't there a positive role or a ray of hope you see in independent or alternative media and journalists to tell the other side of the story? What is your take on that? Well, um, the media 
always has the option to do the right thing. Sadly, the mainstream media rarely does. Um, the media's role in whipping up the demand for war and invasion in Iraq was nothing more than shameful. Um, but I think that uh, the millennials and Generation Z or Gen Z as they like to call themselves are much more discerning than perhaps our generation and they're not as heavily engaged with the mainstream media. You know, um, this is a generation that takes its uh, source from smartphones and um, and the internet and, and you know, here we are um, on Zoom and communicating and crossing borders. So I think that um, I'm quite optimistic that uh, our younger generations are not going to be um, duped by the media in the same way as perhaps our generation was. I think the younger people are much, you know, they question more and uh, they have a, a healthy mistrust of information and how it is um, recycled and pushed out and manufactured. And so um, to that extent, I am more hopeful. I don't think that uh, the world will be whipped up into a frenzy to um, have another war like Iraq or Yemen. Yes, uh, that's a very uh, good ray of hope coming from your side and we do also experience that in back in India. Uh, coming to a very important uh, part of our topic, human rights. We can't uh, go out without talking about women's rights. And women's education and rights uh, have been a subject of heavy debate uh, this year, particularly after the coming back of uh, Taliban. Uh, and much of the blame on, uh, of gender inequality is pinned on Muslim countries and governments. But uh, isn't the story deeper than that? Oh, the story goes much deeper than that. Yes, you're right. Um, quite why women's rights have been eroded uh, in the Muslim world, um, it, it's down to um, the current leaderships. And in many ways, it's down to us as women as well, because um, the Holy Quran makes it crystal clear that we women are equal in spirituality, worth, and education. And it doesn't matter how much misogyny is out there or what the patriarchy is up to, there isn't a man alive who would challenge the word of God and say he's wrong. So if the Quran, which we believe was written by God, if the Quran is telling us that women are equal in spirituality, worth, and education, why on earth are we being treated the way we are around the world? And part of it is because of a lack of knowledge on our part. And we have to go out there and retake our rights. The very rights that um, Khadija, Aisha, um, all the great women in, in the um, early days of Islam enjoyed. And, you know, um, while Western armies are still grappling with the concept of women on the front lines, Muslim women were on the battlefields. And in fact, our beloved prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, singled out uh, one particular female uh, warrior who was everywhere he turned. She was there protecting him. And, uh, you know, there, there were some really heroic women out on the battlefields in those early days of Islam. So why on earth aren't we allowed to go out to the shops in some countries? Why are we not allowed 
to uh, travel a short distance in, in some countries. Um, it's absolutely ludicrous. And, you know, the, as I say, part of it is our fault because we are not asserting and demanding our rights as Muslim women. And part of it is the fault of men who are equally ignorant and don't realize that those rights are ours. It, it's, um, you know, it, it, it is quite astonishing and, um, and quite depressing in some ways. Uh, something related to that itself, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, in comparison with the Muslim world, uh, what is the happening in the so-called liberal societies? Is the picture uh, very good or is it uh, something promising there also? There? Well, we just have to look at what's happening in France, where the French, various French presidents have over the years just ripped the hijab off the heads of, of French schoolgirls, uh, the niqabs from uh, women who uh, prefer to completely cover. And, you know, France is a country which runs around boasting, telling the whole world, we believe in liberty, fraternity, equality. Um, well, not when it comes to Muslim women, they don't. And this is something else that you can tell by the tone of my voice that makes my blood boil. Um, as a woman, if we just put religion aside, just for a second, as a woman, I should have the right to wear what I want, to dress in the style that I want, and um, nobody should be telling me how I should dress. And no man has a right to go into any woman's wardrobe. Now, as a Muslim woman, all the Quran tells me is to cover and be modest. That's all. The rules and regulations regarding how men should dress are many and varied, right down to colors and types of metals and lengths of trousers, all this sort of thing. But for women, all we have to do is cover and be modest. And uh, yet there is so much focus and attention um, in the West, there is an obsession with uh, what Muslim women wear, how they wear it, how they behave, how they act. And it is really frustrating. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of this is driven uh, by men who have this, I call it this white savior complex. You know, we must go out and, and rescue those women. This is how the, uh, these are the words that George Bush and Tony Blair used when they started the war in Afghanistan. We're going in there to liberate the Afghan women. Well, that's what the Russians did. That's what uh, subsequent uh, previous British um, military campaigns, three of them, I believe, all ending in failure um, in Afghanistan did. You know, Afghan women should be among the most liberated women in the world if these men really meant what they said, but uh, they don't. And uh, while Muslim men get accused of oppressing and exploiting women. Well, men in the West have done exactly the same, um, exploiting women in the name of war. You know, who ever heard of a woman being liberated by being bombed? You know, it, it's, um, it's crazy. And uh, which is why, um, you know, I urge women across the world, get involved in politics. Where you have women on the political landscape, where you have women in leadership roles, where you have women um, in prominent positions, uh, there's less chance of going to war. There's less chance of 
death and destruction and there's more chance of um, really productive things happening and the state of, of Muslims today is really sad but if you go back into history Muslims were the great innovators they were the great architects engineers scientists mathematicians uh, medical um, expertise you know we led the world in so many ways so what's happened well what has happened is the role of women has been dimish, diminished in those great golden eras of, of um, Muslim innovation, Muslim women were shoulder to shoulder with the men. But that is not happening today. Again, part of it is our fault. We need to regain our position and take back what was taken from us from those early days in Islam. Um, I think one of the first universities in the world was created by a woman. Mm. One of the first hospitals in the world was opened by a woman. Islam was funded in the early days by a woman who made her money being an international trader. So she must have gone into mixed arenas um, Khadija, obviously, I'm talking about, and um, you know that this is uh, wh why have we lost our power? True, that is a challenge to all Muslim women who are uh, listening to us. Uh, when it comes to this human rights uh, discourse across the globe. Uh, we see odd silences and complications and complaints and these, you know, uh, and for example, the Uyghur um, uh, question or even what is happening to minorities in some of the countries. Uh, you know, much of it has to do with global trade and uh, alliances, actually. But what kind of a vision uh, of vision of a holistic and just discourse of human rights do you uh, envision personally? Well, I think that we just have to come from a very simple position. Human rights are for everyone, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their faith, regardless of their gender, regardless of anything. Um, if you are human, you deserve exactly the same rights as anyone else. And unfortunately, um, this is not the case. You mentioned the plight of the Uyghurs, for instance, who are being persecuted by the Chinese. But unfortunately, there are some nations, some people around the world who will not speak up for the um, Uyghurs because they do not want to have that confrontation with China. So they look the other way um, or they are pragmatic. And uh, you look at the plight of the Rohingya. I remember having a discussion about 15 years ago with a Muslim brother um, about the, the plight of the Rohingya people in Myanmar um, and of he had heavily invested in Myanmar in properties and he was um, sticking up or supporting the position of the Myanmar military and saying, well, you know, uh, but he was just speaking for them because he had personal investments in Myanmar. I haven't had a conversation with him since um, about how the plight of the Rohingya escalated to a point where 750,000 people just dropped everything and ran for the border and are now living in the most appalling conditions in refugee camps in Bangladesh. And uh, 
those people are being told you can go back and they're saying no. You know, who would rather live in a plastic hut supported by bamboo um, rather than go back to their home? What on earth happened to those people to make them think we can never go back? So um, again, you know, that's the uh, Rohingya uh, people. I blame a lot of it on the United Nations. You know, the United Nations came together after the Second World War and they established a very high bar of human rights, of equality, um, all these grand affirmations and declarations, um, which worked well at first. But then um, you look at the state of the United Nations now. Some of the main protagonists of atrocities are sitting in the Security Council. And uh, they look the other way, or they deny that anything is happening. And their friends in the West who are dependent on them, maybe for oil, for power, for energy, for minerals, um, they're also looking the other way. Well, this has got to stop. And, you know, you look at the war in Yemen and these little skeletal babies that are being born who are not going to survive their first year because they will die of malnutrition because of a war. A war that doesn't make any sense. In fact, I don't know many wars that do make sense. And, um, you know, we... It is a very despairing outlook at the moment. Yes, you have hit the nail, uh, you know, now United Nations has become like a silent spectator, or rather we would say that the member nations have see, saw to it that it should be like that, and there won't be any interference from United Nations on what they have been doing to their minorities within their countries and all. So now speaking on the solutions and strategies. Of course, there are legal, political, and social ways to fight injustice and human rights violations within countries. And if we want uh, using the same uh, human rights declaration, uh, you know, you know, uh, we can, uh, we can if we want. So for young and you know, justice-seeking uh, men and women who are facing quite a lot of re repression while going about their work when they raise their voice what uh, you know suggestions or advice oh, do you have or how they should proceed to make this uh, planet a better place a peaceful place place for everyone to live well we've recently had uh, the big climate conference in glasgow and the, the without exception, all of the world leaders have been shamed by uh, this new generation, which isn't prepared to sit back and allow us to destroy the planet anymore. So that's where my optimism comes from. Um, you know, I look back over my shoulder and I am just depressed by what I see a lot of uh, self-serving uh, rulers, um, the patriarchy, um, who have created nothing but chaos, war, uh, death, and, and destruction. But I look forward and I see this um, young generation more determined uh, coming up and you know, that, that is why I'm optimistic, because I look at them and I think they are not going to put up with the sort of nonsense that um, has become almost normal in our lives. You know, men addicted to war, um, 
arms dealers, weapons trade manufacturers, you know, all of this negative industries that are that are growing up um, around us. Hopefully, uh, there will come a time where the need for weapons and and um, their manufacture is replaced by something more positive and more productive. And as I say, just looking at the next generation, I just think, yes, they, they go, they, they're the ones that will teach us lessons. When I go out to speak at um, universities, I see lots of bright, engaged young people, um, men and women who are determined to put this planet back on track um, for a more um, peaceful future. And I think that um, to that extent, the future looks good, but at the moment, um, history has been bleak and the present uh, is also uh, looking bleak. I would like to see uh, Muslim women become more assertive, more demanding, more um, taking back their rights and becoming involved politically within the political landscape. You look at um, female leaders around the world, um, people like Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, isn't really that inspirational. She is as much a victim as the patriarchy as anybody else. If um, she had been born uh, a, a man, um, she would still be in the situation that she's in today. Uh, she is perpetuating her father's uh, leadership and style of rule, and although it's backfired at the moment uh, for her, but um, she is is emblematic of the patriarchy, and and so are some other um, rulers like the uh, Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh. She's part of a dynasty, a continuation of the patriarchy. And she's not there because she's a woman. She's there because of who her father was. So she's an extension of that patriarchy. But you look at other places around the world, the, the New Zealand leader, she's quite inspirational. Uh, the South Korean, uh, the Singapore leaders, these women have um, really risen up. Um, the same uh, with um, Angela Merkel, who opened the, the doors in Germany to more than a million uh, Syrian refugees. And, you know, there, there are inspirational women who can see the bigger picture. And it is a one of peace, a one of promoting peace. Um, a one of turning um, away from violence. And I really think that, um, you know, there are some countries that stand out because they have a gender balanced government. I mean, whoever heard of um, Iceland going to war, Finland going to war, any of the Scandinavian countries, invading other countries, you know, it, it doesn't happen. That's because I believe, you know, that women are getting into places in government and coming up with far more um, productive ideas because going to war should be um, a last resort in anyone's uh, book. But unfortunately, uh, with some of the male-dominated macho governments like we've seen in Britain, like we've seen in America, um, their first point of action has been, right, let's go to war. And, and uh, so hopefully this, as women get more and more involved in politics, this inclination 
um, to embark on a destructive course will um, will become less. And you know, in the, I'm living in Scotland these days, and Scotland has its own government, and we have, uh, or the government here has rolled out something called period poverty, so that women um, who need uh, sanitary uh, wear and uh, and and uh, tampons and sanitary towels and things like that, um, it's freely available for them. Now then you could put 20 male politicians in a room for 10 years to come up with innovative ideas and not one of them would come up with um, let's issue free sanitary uh, uh, um, items to women. You know, with the best will in the world, they never would have come up with that. And so I, I think that um, because women come from a different perspective, I think that uh, they can add so much more to governments. But don't leave it to anybody else to do, to all the women out there who are listening to this, get involved yourself. You know, there are some great female initiatives going around. Uh, you, you mentioned Sister um, India, and I was blown away by this group of women called the Pink Saris. You know, they were direct action. They'd had enough of male violence and domestic violence and, uh, and this amazing movement just emerged and, and you know, they, they did some tremendous uh, work. And I think that that's what more of us have to do is to think out of the box and um, promote our feminine, femininity to, um, to greater aims and to get involved in the political landscape and reshape it into a more female friendly type of foreign policy. Something to think about. Yeah, that sounds like a very good conclusion with more women participating and coming out into society and the political arena without dehumanizing themselves, respecting yes. feminine uh, nature and uh, the governments approving their biological needs, addressing their biological needs and making the public places more and more uh, female friendly, uh, we can uh, bring changes in the world, hopefully. And let's hope that uh, the younger generation are more you know, ready for that. And you know, uh, let's hope that uh, in future, maybe uh, if not our children, our grandchildren will see a better world. And uh, that was wonderful uh, having conversation with you, listening to you. Uh, let's hope our, uh, you know, Aura team will be able to have more conversations with you in future with different topics. So as a signing off uh, message or parting message, if you want to say anything, you can say that and conclude. Thank you so much for being with well, us. All I would say, sister, is do not underestimate your own capabilities. Um, you know, to every person sitting out there listening to this today, um, we can do great things individually, but also coming together, we can also um, achieve great things. And it wasn't politicians that brought down the wall in Berlin, it was people. It wasn't um, politicians or even an army that, uh, that brought down the dictatorship of um, Ehud Mubarak. It, it was ordinary people. It was ordinary people who lit the flame of revolution right across um, the Arab world you know, for this Arab awakening. We can do great things when we come together with determination. And 
so you know never underestimate your own um, capacity to do things to make changes um, I think in fact you know was uh, the Chinese that said uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step once you've made that first step the rest of the journey become so much more easy. So please um, never underestimate your own abilities. Um, always hold on tight to the rope of Allah because when you've got him on your side, you can move mountains. And uh, to all of uh, our sisters, I would say regain what is rightfully ours. We need to be standing shoulder to shoulder with our men so that we can support them and they can support us. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you viewers for watching us. Jazakumullah uh, khair. May God bless you, all of us, and our viewers also. Peace and blessings of Almighty be upon all of us. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.